Hello everyone. While my previous presentation on Beowulf offered some historical context, this one will focus on two additional topics, toxic masculinity and race. Viewing the poem through these two lenses will offer some insight into our understandings of how culture informs and supports both toxic masculinity and racism. Let's get started. First, let's start with the definition of masculinity. Keep in mind that masculinity is defined differently by various cultures. In short, masculinity is all the behaviors, mannerisms, values, and any other characteristics that a society assigns to maleness. It's what a society or culture says makes a man. This can include a wide variety of traits like physical strength, emotional control, competitiveness, aggression, and bravery. While these traits are not inherently toxic, they can become toxic when taken to extremes, which is where the term toxic masculinity comes in. Toxic masculinity refers to the overvalued characteristics of maleness that have a negative impact on others, society, and even other men. Masculinity, in other words, becomes toxic in how it affects others. Although competition, when it's healthy, can have physical and psychological benefits, Toxic forms of competition can include placing too much emphasis on men occupying a kind of pecking order. As men compete for social positions, alphas are valued at a higher rate than betas, despite their mutually beneficial statuses. After all, for there to be an alpha, there must also be betas. This occurs when Unferth challenges Beowulf soon after the latter's arrival to Herod. After Beowulf thoroughly trounces Unferth both rhetorically and in storytelling skill, Beowulf states, The fact is, Unferth, if you were truly as keen or courageous as you claim to be, Grendel would never have got away with such unchecked atrocity. Beowulf is correct in his assertion regarding Unferth. In his culture, men must be able to follow through with their boasts. However, there is only one Beowulf and trying to emulate him can put stress on men and their social relationships. A man's position in society is forever in flux, and there is no way for a man to be alpha in every situation he finds himself. Additionally, masculinity becomes toxic when it rejects all forms of femininity, especially the characteristics a man might exhibit within himself that are labeled as feminine. We can see this symbolically represented in Beowulf's battle with Grendel's mother. Then he saw a blade that boded well, a sword in Grendel's mother's armory, so huge and heavy of itself, only Beowulf could wield it in battle. So the shielding's hero, hard-pressed and enraged, took a firm hold of that hilt and swung the blade in an arc, a resolute blow that bit deep into her neck bone and severed it entirely, toppling the doomed house of her flesh. Symbolically, Killing Grendel's mother is Beowulf destroying the femininity within himself. Also, boys were typically, and to some extent still today, viewed as having too much of the mother in them, and so they have to separate themselves from their mother. Grendel's mother is a mother, and so Beowulf is also cutting off any remaining connection between himself and the mother. Now consider how this thinking might have negative effects on men's relationships with women. While the pictures on this slide are from American history, English history is rife with racism, including in its appropriation of Anglo-Saxon literature as being pure forms of white literature. Indeed, early English scholars continue to debate using the term Anglo-Saxon because white supremacist groups have co-opted the term to support their own ideas. In truth, England has also been a country of immigrants. Even during t the time when Beowulf was written, people from all over Europe, Africa, and Asia have immigrated to the United Kingdom all throughout its history. As a term, race is the categorization of human beings based on physical, social, and cultural differences that are viewed as distinct. Keep in mind that distinctions of race fluctuate throughout history, and these distinctions can include more than skin color. Often, societies now and in the past create us-versus-them distinctions regarding race, resulting in some groups being viewed as sociocultural others. 
Beowulf may not be typically viewed as a text brimming with racial undertones, but the evidence is there if readers care to look. For instance, Grendel and his mother are descendants of Cain, who, out of the curse of his exile, there sprang ogres and elves and evil phantoms. Grendel and his mother have the mark of Cain. For, for well over a thousand years, many Christian cultures viewed physical differences as marks of sin, or as the mark of Cain. As such, anyone who had physical deformities was viewed as monstrous. Interestingly, Grendel and his mother are never completely described. They are given vague adjectives like dark and evil, but we are presented with no clear picture of what they look like. Our imaginations fill in the gaps. Take the following quote as an example. People have seen two such creatures prowling the moors, huge marauders from some other world. One of these things, as far as anyone can discern, looks like a woman, the other warped in the shape of a man. Notice how they are human-like, but warped. And finally, family dynamics that differed from the cultural norm were also perceived as monstrous. For instance, the fact that Grendel's mother is a single mother. They are fatherless creatures. Grendel was born out of wedlock, thus indicating that his mother was a promiscuous woman. The fact that he was raised without a father also is considered perverted by the culture because Grendel never had the opportunity to separate himself from his mother. Since epics reveal a culture's values, it's important to consider both the positive and negative effects of supporting those values. It's good to ask yourself, how much of the good versus evil dynamic is based on racial bias in our literature? Thank you for watching, and please let me know if you have any questions.